Hi everyone, welcome to Say Talks. Today I'm here with Carol Shumate, and she is the author of this book, Projection and Personality Development via the Eight Function Model. So we're going to have a few episodes delving into some parts of the Eight Function Model, and we're going to talk with personality expert Carol, and we're going to learn more. And so thank you for coming out here today. And so, Carol, I was wondering if you could give a quick introduction of yourself for the audience members who are new to you. Sure. Um, I have taught the course on psychological type at Pacifica for the past decade. And um, I'm an author and a scholar. I'm working on another book. I'm a trickster now. Um, and what I want to say about um, the eight function model um, is that what it's really good for is the process of individuation which is why Jung created his model of psychological types to help us see that um, software program that seems to be running us in the background of our personality so that we don't always just respond out of the default settings of that program. I'm gonna start with a story, which is a story that actually happened recently to one of my students. I'll show you this. You can see what, what I think the model is good for. It's managing these um, negative emotions, fear, anxiety, shame, and anger. But the great thing is the model also shows us something that Jung told us over and over again, which is there's gold in the shadow. Now, the student story is fascinating. She is a professional woman. Um, she worked for this uh, she worked for Google. She was very high performing. And by the way, she gave me permission to talk about this. She's going to be writing. She has an article that's going to be coming out in the journal I edit, Personality Type in Depth. So you can read about it more there. But I'll give you the broad strokes. So she worked for Google. She was very uh, high up. She was being groomed for uh, high level executive positions. She had a very glamorous life. She was traveling all the time globally, and she was very good at what she does. You know, that's a very true of many ENTPs. They are um, so competent and they're also very innovative. And at the same time, they have this wonderful charm. And I think the, um, the eight function model helps us see what attributes contribute to what in these types. And the charm of ENTPs, I believe comes from their third function, that extroverted feeling, because BB said that third function is associated with the eternal child. So it's a playful and creative part of us. So she had all these attributes and she's working for a company whose values um, are pretty solid, don't be evil. And then a trickster event occurred. So I'm going to show you what really happened. She waked up one morning and she couldn't get online. I mean, and she, she had meetings scheduled. She didn't know what was going on. Um, finally, she got a call from her manager and he said, I'm so sorry about this. You've been downsized. And she, along with 12,000 other Google employers, employees, um, you know, were axed overnight with no warning. I mean, the only way they knew it was to, when they found out they couldn't go onto their account. And um, so she, you know, I'm gonna ask you the question, when this happens for an ENTP, you know, what, which of their functions do you think get really, um, where does it hurt? Where is the pain? Well, I'll tell you what, you, I'm not gonna put you on the spot. I'll tell you what Jung said. Jung said it's the inferior function. The fourth function is the locus of our inferiority complex. So, this is what triggers us. This is the beginning of what triggers us. 
we can get triggered on any of those functions. But when something hits us at the level of that that makes us feel like a failure or makes us feel inferior, it's usually going to pull up our inferior function. So she has, as an inferior function, introverted sensing. What does that function do? Well, it monitors the internal world, the internal environment of our memories, our body, our home, our filing cabinets, our finances. So it's got all of those, all of those qualities. And I call it the security function because it is really introverted sensing is the guardian for us of all of these things that are vital to our security. And I found this cool little image of a, a house made of dollar bills, which kind of com combines two of them. You know how people who have introverted sensing up high, they're very homebody oriented and they tend to be good with numbers and so forth. So where this hit her was, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? You know, um, there goes my security. Um, and of course, then also feeling like maybe I'm incompetent, which was the worst thing that an ENTP could feel. So the energy around the inferior function is a foolish energy. And I use this little icon of a fool. Because we all have, Marie-Louise von Franz said, this is our inner fool. So we know, because of what von Franz said and what Jung said, that there is archetypal energy around each function. And when Bibi came along, he said, we don't just have four functions, we have all eight. Um, obviously, we have to be using extroverted sensing while we're eating. So he pulled up the rest of them and assigned them these archetypal energies. So we know she started with the inferior function, but then she went down into her unconscious. And this is something else that Jung and von Franz tell us, that the inferior function right at the threshold of consciousness operates like kind of a trap door. We sort of fall down through it and we kind of go unconscious when our inferior function gets triggered and we go down into our lower functions and the lower functions manifest negatively. So which function do you think got triggered? And I'm not gonna let you answer, I'm gonna answer it for you. Um, there are of course a lot of functions involved, but in particular, this was a trickster event. It gave her the feeling of being tricked. And her trickster function is introverted feeling, which is the part of us that tells us what our deepest desires are and what our closest personal values. It's a personal values function. And so what she saw right away is Google's values, don't be evil. It infringed its own values. And so once again, she feels tricked by introverted feeling. Now, if you talk to ENTPs, and you've talked to lots of them, when they get down to it, they have this distrust of their feelings. They don't feel like they can make decisions based on feelings. And so they have this distance from their personal values doesn't mean they don't have personal values. Of course they do, but they just don't like to make decisions based on that because it's, it's down in shadow for them. They're far happier staying, we're all happier staying up in our ego functions. So the Energy around the seventh is trickster energy. And whenever you have a trickster event, quite often it takes you to that function. And this is kind of a wake up call um, of the psyche to tell you, um, hey, there's something you've been leaving out of your life. Now, what's really remarkable about this woman is that she 
looked at it that way. She looked at it. She got, you have to get really honest with yourself when you're down in the trickster, because the trickster is something that we trick ourselves as well as tricking others. We all have it. We develop it in childhood when we, uh, you know, our parents tell us, uh, you've got to be home by 10 o'clock. And you've also got to be super independent and super responsible. So they've got the um, umbilical cord tied to us while they're telling us to be independent. And we, uh, to navigate that uh, child-parent interaction, we have to use some trickster energy. So it's an important defense. These are all important defenses. But we don't want to get stuck in any of them. So what she did to get really honest with herself, she said, you know, she could have gotten a job, another job right away. She was highly employable, but she kind of, she started to realize, gee, I haven't been entirely satisfied with this amazingly glamorous professional life, traveling all the time. And she had, it turned out she had a boyfriend. And one of the things that ENTPs often do is they have all of these projects going um, and part of it, there's kind of a defensiveness against that introverted feeling function, which would call them to make a commitment to a single personal value or maybe a single individual. So there's this defensiveness towards um, intimacy or towards commitment to, to even a single job or a single workplace. So she said, you know, I had to realize I was kind of getting bored with that life. And what did I really want? What is the most important thing to me? Well, what is the most, well, it turned out what the most important thing to her was, it turned out to be marriage and a family. She wanted to have a committed relationship. I just pulled this up from my book. Um, a few little bullet points. There's a whole page of them. But you can see how introverted feeling in the seventh position tends to manifest, tends not to trust own deepest feelings, can struggle to recognize your own deepest desires, can struggle with decisions involving values. And there's a bunch more like that. This is the, the process I'm talking about. Accessing the trickster to integrate the anima. We can't, you know, we can't just go to our inferior function and develop it. Although there are lots of books out there telling us we can. Jung says we can't, von Franz says we can't. It's a big mistake. So what happens? We have to change our attitude toward it. So she changed her attitude. She said, gee, I wasn't really happy. I really want marriage and family. And that boyfriend I've been keeping at arm's length, well, maybe I do really want him. <laughs> and well, reader, to use a, a Jane Austen term, reader, she married him. <laughs> she did. She changed her life. She left New York. She moved across the Atlantic Ocean to Amsterdam. and." Um, so this, what happened is this allowed her to change her relationship to that fourth function, introverted sensing. And she became um, sort of a homebody. Um, and she, she actually took up scrapbooking, you know, all of these things that she had never allowed herself to do. She's allowing herself to do, to pursue all of these introverted sensing pleasures. So that's how it happens. And that's what this, uh, this model is good for. Yeah. As you can see, learning about the eight function model, like it has a lot of practical applications too. And so it really shows how we can get into our inferior function, that extreme stress can actually throw you to your lower down functions, so. Right, and, and all of those negative emotions, they all live down there and we need them. We need fear, we need anxiety, we need all of that. 
And we need those defenses to keep operating with us. We just don't want them to be defending us unnecessarily. And so it's helpful to see how we, uh, how to stop that, how to uh, use this model to analyze, hey, what's going on? And it takes just thinking about it and then looking at the model and asking yourself, what function is operating here? Or what archetype, what archetypal energy is operating? Um, that emotional energy, we can usually identify it faster than we can identify the function. We can usually tell, oh, we're feeling like we're tricked, but the functions are kind of invisible. It's kind of hard to see them, they're sort of like muscles inside. But we generally have some emotion when something triggers us. And uh, we can tell if it's, if it's anger or aggression, that's probably the witch, you know, the witch cynics. Um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, well, I think that that's fascinating. And so each of the functions have an archetype in the eight function model. And so we talked about in preparation of this call that one of your favorite Jungian concepts actually have to do with the eight function model and the trickster. And so I was thinking maybe we could go into that and your thoughts. So you want to talk about enantiodromia now? The trickster is related to in, in antiodromia. In Jung's uh, essay on the psychology of the trickster figure, uh, the very last sentence in the essay mentions in antiodromia, which let me just say for the audience is when you take any position too far, it turns into the opposite of itself. And my personal experience and illustration of that is when I was an adolescent. You know, when we're adolescents, that's when we're really exploring our personality. And we tend to be in excess in our personality a lot in that time. And this is what's charming about adolescence. And also it helps us learn a lot about personality type to to study adolescents when they're in that phase, because we can see those personality types in excess. And the function that God inflated for me was this introverted feeling values function. And in particular, I had this idea of, you know, the whole world should be peace and love and unicorns and uh, happiness and Everybody should be included in everything. And I went around trying to include people, including all the introverts who didn't want to be included. You know? I mean, I was, I was really pursuing this ideal of inclusiveness and um, tolerance. Then, of course, I met some people who were, in my opinion, highly intolerant of other people. And I um, said, by God, you are wrong. You should be tolerant. So basically, I became intolerant of the intolerant. So that's how I went from my value of tolerance to being its opposite. And you can see this with each of the functions if you look at them. <laughs> they all have this in them the possibility of flipping into the opposite. So I became the, the least tolerant person. And I think we all see that very easily with introverted feeling and introverted feeling types. We all look at them and wondering if they're judging us. Most of the time they aren't, but, <laughs> but in fact, we all use that introverted feeling function a little bit that way. It, it has that way of what are our personal values and you can't help but see when something outside of you is is not not in sync with those. Yeah, that's really well put. I like this concept even in looking at how functions can look like different functions, how the opposite is true for the functions. And I'll give an illustration. So there's the stereotype around introverted feeling that it is selfish, 
But actually, a lot of introverted feeling types are selfless because of their values, like inclusiveness <laughs> and tolerance. And so they, they can look the opposite of the stereotype. Whereas with extroverted feeling types, like let's say in, in ENFJ, FE usually has the stereotype of being selfless, mm -hmm. but actually when it's really strong, it can actually look like selfishness of, <laughs> I need to get out rid of all of the group members who are taking away from the group harmony. And it's almost yes. not inclusive. And it yes. is very, so a function taken to an extreme can look like the opposite of what people assume that it looks like in their minds. Beautiful, great illustration. I love that. <laughs> We see in antiodromia, this flipping into your opposite. We see it all the time in politics. And that's the relation. It, it's very tightly related to projection. You know, the very first um, paragraph in my book is about this Mexican president, Porfirio Diaz, who um, campaigned against his rival for the presidency by claiming that his rival was disobeying the law by staying in power, that his rival continued for a second term and a third term and so forth. And so Porfirio Diaz campaigned on this um, campaign slogan, no reelection. Um, I'm not gonna try to pronounce it in Spanish. <laughs> um, and then he got elected on that platform. And what did he do? He wanted to stay in power for an additional term. And so all of his supporters, they came out and they were they were shouting in the streets his own campaign slogan back at him, no re-election, no re-election. So he became the opposite of what he had intended. And we see this with Richard Nixon. I talk about Nixon in my book too. You know, how Nixon, um, he was a real anti-communist always. He was really, um, you know, hawkishly anti-communist. And um, then he, when he was running for um, re-election against uh, McGovern, he created this committee to re-elect the president, an unfortunate acronym uh, because everybody said creep. <laughs> the committee to reelect the president creep um <laughs> and in fact he he had these people who were real creeps who were operating the committee and they broke into the democratic party's headquarters um i mean breaking and entering they broke the law um to steal the democrats records to give him an edge in his reelection campaign and um so the weird thing is he didn't need to do that. He was already so far ahead of McGovern. McGovern was perceived as weak. Nixon was perceived as strong because of his anti-communist hawkishness. Um, but this is what happens when you take a position too far, the harder you try, the worse you fail. And so what happened is um, these guys broke the law, they got caught. And basically he went from being an anti-communist, anti-totalitarian to um, instituting a totalitarian regime in his own administration. These guys had total power to do anything. They were completely lawless. And, um, you know, he became the opposite. His legacy was the opposite of what he wanted it to be. Ooh, Ooh. <laughs> that yeah, that's that is dark indeed. There are a lot of YouTube scandals that happen, and it's basically these YouTubers who do donation campaigns, and they talk about, oh, my mother has this kind of disease, and I'm gonna donate to this cause, and then you realize that they haven't been donating the money at all, and so it's really this like anti like they, they come off as a really generous person and they try to portray that persona but internally there's all this cognitive dissonance of them doing something completely <laughs> opposite to what they say that they're gonna do like the guy that you mentioned and so projection when we talk about it is it also talking about we're projecting our shadow onto the world and then we live out our shadow without knowing it 
Exactly. Everything that we repress into our unconscious, the whole shadow um, is ripe for projection. And also the way, uh, uh, the way the psyche operates, Jung said the psyche is a self-regulating mechanism that um, in order for there to be a balance in the psyche, consciousness has to be exactly mirrored by the unconscious. Now, what that means is um, we're never going to be able to grow our consciousness without growing our unconscious. The shadow is actually just as big as consciousness. Um, so what, but it doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile trying to make aspects of our shadow more conscious. It is because it expands the whole personality. But we just have to be aware that the shadow will always be with us and it will always be just as big as our conscious uh, self is. Mm, yeah, wise words, wise words. <laughs> to quote Carl Jung, uh, until we make the conscious unconscious, it'll guide our lives and we will call it fate. Right. But, yeah, that's why it's so important to learn about the eight function model, guys. And so, right, exactly. Yeah. And so thank you, Carol, for giving that snippet into your thought process around the importance of the eight function model and giving people a little taste of your book. And if people want even more, they can check out the book. It is filled of amazing gold nuggets as we discussed today. So I always tell people it's one of my favorite books, especially it's my the favorite book on the eight function model, um, actually. So thank you. All right, cool. Yeah. Thank you everyone for watching today's episode. We'll see you all in the next one. Thank you.